Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor John Davenport, who is absolutely the quintessential whole organism biologist. He's his work. I was very excited when when um, John Davenport um, joined the the team to write the biomechanics chapter with his with his co-author um, Yuki Watanabe, and um, he has been researching since the 1970s. <laughs> the most amazing breadth of, of critters, everything from bivalves to barnacles, blackbirds, bovines, badgers, dogfish, dippers, terrapins, toads. I think John embodies the um, the 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 power and and utility of researching whole organisms in their environment. And he certainly has taken a deep dive into the biomechanics of ocean sunfish. So without further ado, oh, I will mention that John um, is an emeritus professor at the University College Cork of Ireland, now visiting professor, I believe at Exeter, University of Exeter in um, the UK. So without further ado, let me bring John into the stage. John, I'm so glad that, that you could, you could um, give a talk this morning. Oh, thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, Tierney. Uh, it's much appreciated. Um, uh, is everything ready for me to go ahead now? I think so. I think so. And then after you give your talk, we'll just come back and ask a couple questions. Right. Um, uh, first of all, I want to uh, uh, point out again that this is uh, that I'm talking on behalf of two of us, so Yuki Watanabe from uh, uh, Tokyo and myself. And we've got a rather broad topic of locomotory systems and biomechanics of the ocean sunfish. Um, now, that's broad, and I've only got about 15 minutes. So I'm going to talk about three things, um, fins, muscles, and capsule. And I'll explain what the capsule is uh, a little uh, later. First of all, with fins, um, uh, Quite often, the ocean sunfish is uh, described as a, a, a swimming head uh, because uh, it has um, uh, uh, no uh, true caudal fin at all. Uh, it's as if uh, the fish had been um, uh, cut off just behind the dorsal and anal fins, which you can see uh, on this slide. Um, and uh, there is also um, a structure which looks a little bit like a, a caudal fin, but isn't, called a clavus. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now, uh, if we look at this uh, photo here, which is uh, taken from the left-hand side of a, an ocean uh, sunfish swimming quite quickly, you can see that the dorsal and anal fins uh, beat together. And uh, 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 for quite a long time, it was thought that they, uh, they just paddled uh, the fins. But now we've, uh, we've found that they use their fins rather like the uh, flippers of penguins and sea lions and turtles, uh, in which uh, the um, propulsive organs work like wings, not like paddles. In other words, they produce uh, force pretty well throughout the uh, uh, cycle. The other thing you can see from that particular drawing uh, is that the the clavus uh, appears to be uh, slightly uh, moved opposite to uh, uh, the uh, two fin, uh, the the dorsal and anal fins, which are beating. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, there are uh, a couple of big uh, differences. Um, uh, from uh, the other underwater flyers like penguins, like uh, sea lions. Uh, first of all, uh, the uh, fins beat uh, from left to right uh, instead of uh, up and down as they do in the uh, penguin. Um, but also uh, the um, uh, fins are not paired. Um, we're used to the idea of uh, paired fins in... Um, uh, uh, forms like the um, uh, uh, penguin, uh, but in the case of the sunfish, you have uh, two fins which are not uh, embryologically related at all. 
Uh, now, uh, here I want to uh, talk about some work that uh, came out of Yuki's group. Um, they looked at the um, shape of the uh, fins and at the top left of this uh, bit of the slide, you can see the shapes of the fins uh, of uh, fish ranging from two kilograms to nearly a ton. And you can see two things from that. First, um, that the dorsal fin and the anal fin have very similar shapes, but also as the fish gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the shape of the fins um, change. They um, uh, start off uh, slim and long and end up uh, rather squat and wide. And uh, at the uh, top right, uh, we can see that the uh, anal fin area and the dorsal fin area are extremely similar. So despite the fact that they're not paired fins, um, uh, they have uh, very similar shapes and areas. Um, uh, at the left-hand side, we have a, a graph of the aspect ratio of the fins against body mass. Now, as aspect ratio is a measure of the... Um, uh, uh, shape of the uh, fin in terms of uh, how uh, broad or narrow the fin is and an aspect ratio technically is the um, uh, span of the um, wing or, or flipper um, uh, and divided by the average um, uh, width and we can see that uh, if we look from uh, small fish around um, two two or three kilograms, they have an aspect ratio of about um, uh, three and a half. Um, but by the time they get up to about a ton, they're below um, an aspect ratio of two. So the uh, fins change a great deal in shape. So just to summarize, they have similar sizes, their shapes are similar and their shapes change with age. Now that automatically means that the efficiency of the fins change because uh, their lift to drag ratios um, get lower as the fish get um, older and bigger. So uh, we can also say that um, ocean sunfish are relatively faster swimmers uh, when they're younger and smaller. This is an area that we could really look at in some more detail. Next, I want to uh, go on to uh, say a little about the muscles. Uh, the main picture has um, a side view of a sunfish, which has had the skin removed so that we can see the muscles underneath. Uh, and you can see that uh, there are two broad muscle blocks, the dorsal fin muscles uh, and the anal fin muscles, and they're separated by the horizontal septum, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment. Now you can immediately see that the shape of these uh, muscle uh, blocks is very, very different between the uh, two sets of muscles. But on the other hand, if you compare the mass of the anal fin musculature with the that of the dorsal fin musculature, again, we find that they, they fall on a, a straight line on a log-log plot. And so they're essentially very similar indeed. Um, that's just a summary. Now, uh, here we have a, uh, a dissection uh, of um, uh, a medium-sized sunfish. This one was about uh, 17 or 18 kilograms and came ashore in uh, Northern Ireland and uh, I was involved with the dissection. Now, at the top left, um, panel A, uh, we can see the dorsal and anal fins, but the skin has been removed. The skin is very thin and rough, it's scaleless. Uh, and underneath is a bright white um, subcutaneous layer, which uh, we are now calling the capsule. And uh, I'll say a bit more about that later on. In panel B, um, the capsule, which is quite thick in a fish this size it's uh, uh, varies between about one centimeter thick and three depending on where you are in the body um, the 
uh, capsule has been removed and you can see um, two, the two muscle blocks, the dorsal uh, muscles and the anal muscles, but the code is DW because they are white muscles. Fish in general have two sorts of uh, muscles, um, white muscles which are used for sprinting and red muscles uh, which um, are used for cruising. That's a, a, a very crude version. Now on the uh, main panel, panel C, um, you can again see the dorsal fin at the top. You can see the dorsal white muscles uh, and in th at this particular stage of the dissection, um, it's only the dorsal white muscles that you can see. But uh, lower in the dissection, uh, the anal uh, fin white muscles have been totally removed and you can see uh, darker muscles, which are the anal uh, red muscles, um, anal fin red muscles, uh, which are used for cruising. Uh, we can also see the horizontal septum, which um, acts like a diaphragm between the two, two sets of muscles. Um, and most of the white muscles are attached um, at one end to the horizontal uh, septum which is fibrous and elastic. Now, uh, the other thing you can see in this diagram that I want to draw your attention to uh, are the red arrows. Now, uh, each of those red arrows indicates um, uh, a hemal spine. Uh, so that's part of the skeleton. And you can see that the um, uh, anal fin red muscles are actually attached to um, the uh, hemal spines. Uh, they're actually the only uh, propulsive muscles that are attached to uh, skeleton. Uh, all of the rest of the um, uh, muscles are attached uh, either to capsule or to um, uh, the horizontal septum. All right, next slide. Now, um, the third topic I want to introduce is that of the capsule. Now, um, technically, this is part of the skin. Uh, it's a, 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 a subcutaneous layer. And uh, if you look at uh, any of these, you can see that the, um, any of these uh, diagrams, you can see that uh, the capsule is bright white in color uh, and uh, doesn't have any obvious structure, but it's quite thick, as you can see uh, from panel A. Um, where uh, you can see my finger, um, uh, I took a selfie, um, uh, uh, pulling the capsule back to look underneath. So if we look at panel A first, um, we're looking at the um, dorsal muscles, uh, dorsal fin muscles, and uh, we can see uh, that uh, uh, we're, we're looking at white muscles, um, Incidentally, there are dorsal red muscles, which are also um, buried beneath uh, white muscles, but uh, and I may be able to show a, another slide later if there's time. Um, the black arrows indicate um, tendons which attach the white muscles to the capsule, and uh, we can see those um, enlarged in uh, B, panel B, and enlarged still further in um, uh, panel C. Now in panel C you can see individual small tendons indicated by the black arrows uh, and uh, the uh, structure labeled B is a muscle belly which is uh, attached by those tendons to the capsule. Now the capsule um, has uh, a number uh, of different um, uh, functions. Um, and because of our work, we now know more about it. First of all, it gives the whole fish um, a streamlined body shape. So uh, it's a shaping structure. Um, and in fact, uh, although the uh, ocean sunfish looks a rather cumbersome fish in some ways, it's actually quite well streamlined. Secondly, as we can see from these, um, from the picture I've just described, um, the capsule functions as an exoskeleton to which uh, muscles and tendons um, 
and scepter are attached. Now, uh, it is unusual for um, a teleos fish to have an exoskeleton, but a few do, um, uh, several of them being in the same overall group as the sunfish. So thirdly, um, the capsule gives muscle attachments. And fourthly, and this is something that Yuki's group has uh, studied more than me, um, the capsule gives uh, neutral buoyancy. And I'll say a little more about that in a moment. Um, just to give you some uh, figures, seawater has a, uh, a density um, pretty well worldwide of 1.026 kilograms per meter cubed. Now, uh, Yuki's group measured uh, whole sunfish density at 1.027, which is slightly negatively buoyant, but very close indeed to neutral buoyancy. Um, this is important because the sunfish, adult sunfish, don't have swim bladders. Now, the capsule material is much less dense than seawater, and it has a density of 1.015 kilograms per cubic meter. And that is independent of body size. The capsule density is the same for a, a small uh, two kilogram animal as it is in an animal that weighs uh, two tons. So um, the capsule provides a lot of negative buoyancy and that uh, helps, um, sorry, positive buoyancy, and that helps to offset the um, denser materials uh, of the uh, sunfish in terms of bones and muscles. Now, we, what we do know is that uh, the proportion of the uh, sunfish which is devoted to the capsule varies with size. Um, it makes up a lot, 26.7% um, of two kilogram individuals. Um, and Yuki's group did find that a 247 kilogram individual, the capsule made up um, 44%. Now this probably means uh, that uh, the maximum uh, size of an ocean fun sunfish, which is around uh, nine times as big as that uh, 247 kilogram in individuals, is probably mostly made up of capsule, but at the moment we have not um, done anything to um, uh, try and find out whether that's absolutely certain. It's quite a logistic problem. Now, um, uh, my part of the group uh, did some uh, histology. Uh, we also found that uh, the uh, uh, capsule is uh, gelatinous in that it's around 90 or 91 percent water content. So um, it's um, very watery material. But when you um, look at the histology, you find that there is um, a meshwork of um, material um, supporting the capsule. And this meshwork is not directional. There's no sign of any uh, direction whatsoever. And it's made up of um, two categories of um, uh, proteinaceous material. First of all, it contains collagen. And collagen helps to give some rigidity to the exoskeleton and uh, the finer fibers are made up of elastin uh, which gives uh, flexibility. The other thing that's noticeable from a histological point of view is that although we took samples from different areas of the body they were all very very poorly vascularized so there was very little uh, blood supply or drainage to the capsule and this tends to suggest that um, uh, it's energetically inexpensive to um, maintain uh, and probably um, uh, its structure doesn't turn over very frequently but this is uh, an area where we need more work um, uh, we need more work um, in terms of the fins we could do with knowing more about the um, uh, red muscle, um, uh, 
to see if it's like the red muscle of um, uh, other TDOs. Uh, we could also uh, do with finding out a little more about the um, function of the clavus. Uh, but as far as the capsule is concerned, um, we need, for example, to find out uh, what its um, ionic concentration is and whether, whether um, there's any sign of um, uh, control over the um, uh, proportion of divalent ions in there. So there's quite a bit of work to be done. So uh, I'd like to finish um, by um, uh, putting out some acknowledge acknowledgements. Uh, Yuki has put some up. Uh, I owe a considerable debt to Natasha Phillips, um, who uh, got me interested in uh, the beast, and to um, uh, John Houghton, Paul Larson, Lawrence Eadling, and Liz Cotter. So a lot of people th to thank. And um, being old, I got um, some... Uh, travel grant money that enabled me, enable me to work with the scientists. And uh, just at the bottom of this slide, uh, there are the two main um, uh, references uh, that support this uh, chapter and presentation. Okay. Well, thank you so much, John. As you know, um, my my um, love in graduate school is is um, biomechanics, so your chapter is near and dear to my heart. My advisor, Steve Wainwright, would always say, "When there's some extreme anatomical form, it's revealing some interesting secret." So I think the sunfish really embodies that, um, you know, extreme anatomy in in so many ways. Um, you did touch on a couple of things. So just in in the chapter and also in keeping with with terminology with what Kate Bemis has written in hers, we we called the capsule the hypodermis. Yes. And so I just wanted to clarify that for the, for the audience that that um capsule is is your term, hypodermis is the is the term that's used in the chapter and also used by um in our anatomy chapter as well. So so um it, it has those those two names and it is such an interesting such an interesting material um we looked at that we looked at the hypodermis um and found that it was primarily reticulated collagen and then and now that you you found that there's elastin in it it reminds me of um stories of of fishermen of yore who would take the skin and turn it into little bouncy balls for <laughs> for kids as a as a kind of toy that was written about um you know over a century ago that they would use that strange sunfish skin to do that um but you mentioned a couple really really interesting things i wanted to to ask you about and touch on and first is this you know this interesting tactic of being able to use non bony cartilaginous material as a skeleton yeah uh, i mean i uh, i came across this um all oh, back in the 80s when i worked on um lumpfish mm -hmm. now with the lumpfish um they're even more extreme although they're a teleos the uh, skeleton is entirely cartilaginous if you take an x-ray you just get a blob mm -hmm. no sign of any structure at all um now with the um sunfish um a lot of the skeleton is, is cartilaginous, yeah. um, but I suspect it may well get less cartilaginous as it gets older. Yeah. Um, I think um, because the um, uh, capsule or hypodermis um, uh, occupies a bigger and bigger chunk of the animal as it gets older, I think uh, maybe that does balance um, calcification a bit. Uh, certainly, um, uh, the uh, hemal uh, and uh, neural spines aren't quite well calcified, but on the other hand, uh, the skull isn't particularly so. Right, um, right. Uh, the other thing that interests me about the hypodermis is that it's clearly not exactly the same material um, in terms of stiffness um, and toughness in different parts of the animal. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a uh, certainly around the bases of the um, uh, uh, dorsal and anal fins. It seems to be 
uh, stiffer than, say, uh, uh, the part that overlays the middle of the body. So I, I think the scope for finding out quite a lot more about uh, the hypodermis. Uh, I'm, what I'd really like to know is uh, uh, whether the um, ionic content is around uh, 300 milliosmoles, which is what you expect from teleos tissues, mm -hmm. uh, uh, particularly as there seems to be so little vascularization. Um, right, so, right. Um, uh, uh, it would be relatively easy with the right equipment to do that, um, but uh, that would certainly be worth a look. Um, and I would, I suppose, I would hypothesise that part of the um, um, uh, the buoyancy function, the, the, the positive buoyancy, comes from uh, low um, uh, overall ionic uh, concentrations. But mm -hmm. then, of course, you might expect them to uh, perhaps get rid of divalent ions. Um, but, so there's definitely a buoyancy story uh, still left in there. Uh, oh, yeah. No, um, I, I... At the I, moment, we only know a bit about the histology. We know a bit about uh, the density uh, mm -hmm. of the whole tissue. But what we don't know is the physiology of the tissue. Yeah, yeah. The buoyancy is really interesting, especially when you think that they're diving down a 1,000 meters. And so you're going to have some differences in, in um, the, you know, how how does that... If it's you know in in particularly in very large animals when it's forty four percent potentially of their mass, yeah, I think I think in a really big one it's more than that. It's probably it's quite likely to be as much as sixty percent. Yeah, and and so and that is a massive amount of material. It can be inches thick, particularly on the keel, um, and then you're you're submerging that three thousand feet, a thousand meters. You're going to have some really radical changes. In. Yeah, um, it, it's a better it's a better mechanism than a swim bladder, though. If you're going to do uh, vertical migrations, um, mm -hmm. swim yeah. bladders have the problem that if uh, if you're going up, they expand, and it's all, all too easy to keep on expanding too far. Um, so, uh, but you're right. I mean, there will be some compressive effects, and it will right. be possible to calculate those. Yeah, just, and just as an aside, uh, one of the things I've noticed about the um, uh, material of the hypodermis is that it's a bit greasy. I think mm -hmm. there might actually be a, a wee bit of lipid in there as well. So it may be one of the most complicated um, buoyancy um, structures, stroke mechanisms around, but um, yeah. uh, you really need um, access to very fresh material to work on that. Yeah, and it is completely unique. I mean, there's no other fish that has, it's like this thick white coconut meat. It, it, you know something really interesting is going on in, in um, mechanistically when yeah. the sun, you open up a um, a sunfish, as well as, you know, just the, the fact that it can act as this ecto, exoskeleton, which we see more commonly in something like sharks or, you know, um, it just it makes me think of the West Nate Wainwright paper um, when you're talking about the horizontal septum as well. Yeah. How muscles can can um, you know key into the horizontal septum and then they have to work in unison for it to actually work. Oh yeah, I mean if if the um, uh, that's why I think the um, anal fin red muscles is effectively decoupled from that because. Mm -hmm. the, they are not attached to the horizontal septum, whereas the dorsal fin red muscles are. And I think that may well be uh, important uh, when they're uh, moving at relatively slow speeds. Uh, it enables, uh, and we do see from video that although when they're swimming um, regularly and fast, uh, the two fins are very closely coupled. Mm -hmm. uh, when they're maneuvering or when they're um, Moving slowly, they're not so closely coupled, and I think oh, that yeah. I think the fact that the red muscles are separate uh, is um, is interesting, and certainly um, again well worth a look. I mean, from a biochemical point of view and a histological point of view, I'd love to look more at the uh, what I what we've described as white muscles and red muscles because um, there's a, a very big literature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's nothing uh, to speak of with uh, with fin muscles. Um, uh, I think that's partly because in most um, 
uh, teleos, the um, the fin muscles are actually quite short, and uh, uh, people have not been as interested in them as the uh, as the big, thick axial muscles. But right. I'd love to know how much uh, convergent evolution is going on with these um, uh, sunfish in terms of uh, 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 their sort of cruising and their burst speed musculature. Yeah, it would be really interesting to be able to put on accelerometers and see, you know, how much of their time is actually spent asynchronously finning, um, sculling, as opposed to, to synchronously. Because certainly in the field when I've watched them, you know, when they're going, when they're sort of heading out, going, trying to get from point A to point B, it is, it is, it's asynchronous. You know, it's, it's like this. They're yeah. not, they are not finning together. That only comes when they really need to crank away from someone yeah but, and that, that's when they're using the white muscles and uh, yeah. they're coupled coupled with the septum yeah, yeah. yeah. there's a lot yeah. more a lot more mileage to be got out of them oh definitely and so many more questions they also have a really large urinary bladder and urine is less dense than seawater too so there may yeah. be i remember talking to knut schmidt nielsen um years ago at, um, at Duke, and he he was commenting on their large urinary bladders and the possibility of of that being a, a buoyancy deterrent, um, you know, entering into the buoyancy equation as well. Yeah, that that's interesting because the the lumpfish has a very big urinary bladder, and mm. uh, I actually managed to get. Um, uh, I was working in Norway, and uh, they were very good. We just took the samples around to the hospital path lab. <laughs> complete analysis and a little note saying this patient is dead um, <laughs> uh, but they they have a big uh, urinary uh, bladder and uh, one of the things uh, we found and this quite likely uh, applies to female sunfish is that uh, uh, the eggs when they're being developed uh, are likely uh, quite dense and they're surrounded by ovarian fluid. Now we found that the uh, one of the things about um, teleos fish is that the um, hardening of the eggs, um, the hardening of the chorion that occurs just after the eggs are fertilized and released, mm -hmm. um, that's very dependent on uh, divalent ions. So we found that the, um, uh, the uh, ovarian fluid were, had virtually no divalent ions at all. It was mm -hmm. almost pure sodium chloride. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we reckon that the uh, large urine volume was needed uh, to basically get rid of um, uh, because it was uh, the urine was quite rich in divalent ions. Mm -hmm. We reckon they needed the big uh, 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 urine volume uh, to get rid of the uh, divalent ions that uh, allowed the ovarian fluid to stay um, uh, in the state it was. Now. I don't know how, uh, I never dissected um, uh, a big enough sunfish. I have no idea whether there is a copious um, uh, ovarian fluid. There may not be because the eggs are pelagic, whereas the eggs of yeah. the um, uh, lumpfish are um, benthic. So um, it may be a different story there. But that, that could, uh, it could be related. And in yeah, any I case. Have, I have it, a, it, a dissected a very, um, you know, densely packed single ovary. They only have the single ovary. And um, it just seemed to be all eggs in there. <laughs> oh, right. so there's, no, there's no free fluid. I mean, in the lump fish, uh, uh, when the fish are ripe, uh, mm -hmm. there's a very definite... Um, um, ovarian fluid in there. Uh, ovarian mm -hmm. fluid compartment that, that you can get huge amounts of um, sample from. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, it may well be that getting rid of divalent ions uh, from the um, uh, capsule, for example, is a reason for the um, uh, uh, large uh, urine volume in the sunfish. Yeah, yeah. So many, so many additional um, questions that need to be answered. I mean, it just brings up it brings up lots of um, lots of additional additional work. I mean, the histology of the skin, the ontogenetic sequence of what's changing in terms of the thickness of the hypodermis and the aspect ratio of the of the fins and how that's relating to their physiology and to their diet and where they're going throughout their their small um, 
infant stage up into adult stage. I mean, it's there's a lot of remaining questions. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can keep on thinking of questions all the time, thankfully. Yeah. Yes, yes. So are, are you and Yuki going to keep keep um, keep answering these questions, keep at it? With uh, I think, that, well, it, it's a strange world at the moment with the pandemic. Um, yeah. uh, the work I was involved with was dependent mostly on a single specimen that came ashore mm -hmm. in Ireland. Um, I mean, Yuki and I... Um, uh, haven't worked together. We haven't published together, um, and uh, I don't see any sign at the moment of uh, being able to work on sunfish very easily for a while. At the moment, I'm doing work on flatfish of various sorts. Oh. Um, uh, but I am uh, part of the problem is that I'm retired, and um, life is difficult enough for young scientists without. Um, fossils coming along to um, <laughs> get in the way. Um, oh, I would not say get in the way. As, but as they, they really are having a very bad time at the moment. I mean, yeah. um, postdocs and PhD students can't do field work. They can't do much lab work yeah. uh, because of the pandemic. So, um, uh, well, maybe, um, i never say never. Um, right. Um, well, I think your work and Yuki's work, and that's one of the great things I, I thought about the book was bringing you guys together to work together because you're two great anatomical, physiological minds. Um, well, you did a good job bringing us together and you did an excellent job in putting the book together. Um, uh, and Marshall, I mean, it must be like herding cats. <laughs> well, it was a good it was a good group of cats. You all were a good group of cats because I didn't, I didn't have to herd too much, but certainly Graham and Jonathan were we're great partners in that endeavor. But um, I think John, you've really, in, and and you with Yuki have inspired other, other younger scientists who I, I, um, I think will, will, you know, embrace those questions, um, take you guys along when they get, when they get fresh specimens, hopefully, and there'll be more collaborative publications to, to come. Yeah, I, think well, I hope so. Inspiring work. Um, Unfortunately, uh, we don't get uh, uh, fish reliably uh, here yeah. in uh, the UK or in or in Ireland. I, I've got words out so that uh, there are things I can do if I do get a specimen, but um, yeah, that's uh, that's just down to chance. Well, well, I'll keep my my ears and eyes open as well, and um, and if I if I um, have a chance to talk to any sunfish heading to the UK, I'll say wash up near John. Yeah, have you still, have you still got uh, animals in the Monterey Aquarium? We do actually, and the aquarium um, is looking to open this month after a year of closure. Um, so fingers crossed that that will that will occur, and there's one on um, ready to be displayed. So, so yeah, come yeah. visit when when time allows and and COVID allows. But I think we we may be seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. Um, uh, uh, because uh, the, the UK, we've got an awful lot of people vaccinated. Uh, we've just about got to uh, uh, half the population, adult population now, which is good. Yeah. Um, so um, it's, it's getting a bit safer to go out there. But um, mm -hmm. the universities are all rather shut down. My, uh, and it's very, I know it's very difficult for my friends who've had to um, develop ways of um, teaching online at very short notice and in large quantity. I mean, the, the, it's hard work. The guys have had to produce what, what would normally take six years. They've had to do it inside a year. To right. Yeah, not easy. Anyway, no. thanks very much for having me. Uh, yes, and thank you so much, John. And um, if there are some additional questions, once we put this out, um, we'll, um, we'll send them your way. Yeah, well, my email's uh, available. It's uh, on the front of the thing. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, bye now. Bye-bye.